welcome. You're, thank, you. thank you. And um, it's really great interviewing you. It's going to be like our living room conversations no, we're no, having no, no, in no. the evenings. <laughs> okay, jokes aside, uh, the reason I think Christine asked me to do, because you are a very complex person, personality. Many may know you um, as uh, the winemaker, as the, um, the bubbly, funny, always warm person. And I find that you have so many layers that can be explored. There are so many interviews about you, with you. There's even a movie. So we'll try today to unlock some of the stories that are untold. So, for the audience to know, so you were born in Syria. When you were three years old, you moved to Beirut, Lebanon. You lived in West Beirut. And then you lived there up to the point when you, one year earlier that you were supposed to be drafted, you voluntarily joined the army for a war that was not your war. Why did you do that? And what was, when you're re remembering that, you have such a smiling face. What was the reason? Well, um, in Lebanon, we had to do military service when you finish high school and you're 18. And um, I could have waited one more year and the draft ended, by the way. Um, but I was ready to do something new. It was, I felt I had to, you know, the, just finished high school, studying, uh, some sort of adventure. So I joined the army. It was a one-year service um, just to see um, what I could do or what I could experience. And it was the first time, actually, I lived with, uh, you know, we lived in an Armenian community, but we were in Lebanon and everyone was Lebanese. So this was the only place where I was the only Armenian and the whole barracks were, uh, let's say, Lebanese uh, army. And it was an incredible, really wonderful experience. Yeah. So uh, I was uh, in the, at the barracks was the music department of the army. So we had to do solfege in the morning, do re mi and whatnot. And I didn't know music, actually. I don't know why I was drafted there. I think I happened by chance. So we had to do either a kitchen service, the uh, tree service, whatever there was work to do. And, you know, so it was making hummus for a few couple of thousand people. I think the soldiers with a hand crank, you know. And uh, so there's a lot of that kind of stuff. And you had to rotate the sandbag duty because the barracks was right on the line between Muslim neighborhood and a Christian neighborhood. Uh, so we had to do barrack duty. And the first time I did it was like, whoa, because no one is supervising you. No one wants to go there. So you're all on your own, alone, I mean, with three or four other soldiers. Uh, and then I realized and I asked whether I could exchange barrack duty for making food and hummus. And they said, sure, if you... And all of the other students, all of the other let's say, the ones who were drafted, opted to stay in the barracks, and they didn't want to do because it was dangerous. There was fighting, there was whatever. So that's what I did. And I had a friend who used to come through the back roads, back streets, and bring some meat, and we would make grill and whatnot. So it's some shooting happening. But for an 18-year-old, it was, I don't know, like every time I tell this story, I don't know, everyone is like amazed. Uh, you know, my sense of danger is a little bit maybe... My tolerance for danger is a little bit more high, and it's more exciting. So that was uh, <laughs> that was my military service. Uh. So part of the the reason that um, maybe let's give a little bit of an introduction that after that you went to Italy, and then uh, you picked up the language. And Italian has been and is so much part of your life. So is the Italian culture. But I think a few may know how you really ended up in Italy. Tell us the story of why Italy? Well, that was my father's poor side. We lived in the Muslim neighborhood. 
and they used to see me when I used to take a break with military out, you know, clothing. You would come home, and he thought he was forward-looking a bit. He said, you know, you better let's take you out of here. And I applied for, I spoke English at the time, of course, U.S. visa and U.K. visa, and none of those embassies would give me. And somehow we had a contact uh, through the Italian embassy, and uh, I got a, they gave me a scholarship. I went to Italy. I studied, and the guy asked, what does your son do? He says he loves photography. So they wrote down graphic arts. So I went to Urbino to study graphic arts and study the language. So that was my first stint. Uh, and my kind of, it was a huge opening, you know, getting to Italy and experiencing a whole complete new culture. Actually, I was wondering whether my both my children are here, the twins, Amy and Luca, and I was wondering whether they know this story, whether I have told them. So it so happened I went to uh, to the U.S. After my stint in uh, Italy, I went to the U.S. to finish my college degree. Um, and when I was going to college, I had to work, make a living. And one of my friends was working at a donut shop. So he said, there's a job. You want to make donuts? Like, sure. You know, so I went and made donuts for maybe a couple of months on a fryer and graveyard shift, 11 at night till 7 in the morning. And it was it just, I mean, the, the money was minimum wage, so there was no way I could do anything with it. But in Washington, the first time I went, I had worked as a waiter, as a bartender, waiter, and you made real money. And I kept looking, looking, and then I saw an announcement in LA Times that there was Italian restaurant looking for a captain. I didn't know what a captain was. Apparently, he was the guy who took the orders and gave it to the waiter to get the food. So it was kind of fun, sure. And it had to be Italian. You had to be an Italian. Uh, it, you know, in those days, you, they could discriminate, I guess. So I went uh, for the interview and spoke Italian. Uh, very comfortable. I said, what's your name? I said, Franco. I uh, <laughs> Literally, it was Franco. And it's like, okay, great. You know, check me out, tuxedo, and come tomorrow to start working. I came and figured out what the captain does, and, you know, I blended in. I'm, you know, I, I feel comfortable in this kind of uh, milieu, and uh, started working until it was, uh, they had to pay me a uh, salary. You know, every two weeks they cut you a check, you know, for what it is. And I went, uh, and the lady there, it was his wife. I said, what's your, you know, you have a passport? I gave my Lebanese passport by Kishkarian. I said, I told you, Franco, well, yes, they call me old Franco. My mother is Italian. My, my father is Italian. My mom is, you know, sorry, my mom is Italian, my father, and, you know, whatever. Or, you know, I did quickly. And by then, I was in already. And so it's like they didn't care. And uh, that Franco carried on because what used to happen is, like, you worked in a restaurant, and if you were good, was uh, the chef? Let's say he went to another restaurant, and then he would call, "Hey, Franco, we're opening one in Beverly Hills. You know, come, it's a great restaurant." So we would move, and it all the way to San Francisco. Franco, Franco, Franco. Yeah. So I don't use it anymore. It's like, <laughs> well, so kids, if anyone calls you, it says it's Franco. That's your dad. Why? <laughs> um, I think this uh, ability that you can take whatever life is throwing at you and make something beautiful out of it is unique. You like to say, okay, we've, we got lemons, we make lemonade. Yes. And it's very true about yourself. And one of that things is the, um, how you are facing difficulties. Because you, you have managed to rise from the ashes not once. So you started a new twice from zero. And um, the time that you were in Italy for 12 years making wine, uh, in the end, you went through bankruptcy. But even then, you didn't break. There was a decision that you have made, which I think is so important for, for all of us today to, to know how you've thought and how you've managed to pull yourself together and take that step. Could you please tell that story? 
Um, I did that three times. No, I didn't go bankrupt three times, but I started from zero three times. So the first one was, uh, you know, it was a choice. I had the restaurant and I didn't want to do it anymore. I, you know, it was too confining every day in the restaurant, same clients, whatever. So I needed to see experience. So I knew Italian and I knew wine. So I started importing Italian wine. So I had to leave the restaurant without any compensation. It was my brother-in-law. Hi, you take care of it. I'm moving on. So I started dealing in wine, bringing wine, what not. And that was good before did this for four years. Uh, maybe less, yeah, around four years or so. And I wanted to live in Tuscany. At the time, Tuscany was big. It was beautiful. Everything was gorgeous. And I kept reading these cookbooks and Tuscan farmhouses, wine and food and everything else. So it's like, okay, I'm, we're moving to Tuscany. And uh, so and we did. So I had to let off, go of that one and start all over again in uh, Tuscany. And there I really kind of got excited. I bloomed. I got a one winery. I leased the winery. Then another winery in Puglia. Then I made wine in Australia. You know, so... I was all over the place, you know, trying to, to as if I had a timeline, I had to fit all this project in one thing. And of course, you do that, you overextend yourself and inevitable crash. I crashed, I had to file for bankruptcy and uh, start from zero. Um, the children, the Amy and Luca know this story, of course. And um, so uh, we, uh, I had to either go work for somebody um, or try to figure out a way to do it myself again. And I realized if I went to work for somebody, I even if I saved for the next 15 years, the money I had borrowed for the family to sustain ourselves, it would have taken forever. And then I decided, okay, let me give it a shot. And I had very good clients from the old days. I had contacts from winemakers, different things, and started cutting deals. And then, you know, after six, seven months, I was back where I was. And, uh, you know, so it was an um, experience. After, after you do it while, then you learn how to manage cash, how to run your business, and not to overextend, you know. So it was a good experience. Yeah. But recently, you said, that's not enough. Let's explore Iran. Wine and Iran. How did that happen? Um, well, I saw the effect of the wine industry rebirth in Armenia, how it affected our dining culture, our uh, the way uh, we we talked around the table. Wine kind of um, opens up conversations; it brings us together, uh, and at the end of the day. Uh, we remember the conversations, not the wine itself. The wine is just a facilitator of getting things done. Uh, and it was a sense of pride for for us, for Armenian consumers, because it's like a, a, business, like a visit card, as we say, wine, Armenian wine to the world. Now we export, and so people will know the country through its wines. Uh, and because we were neighbors with Iran, and I had done research, there were a few countries that were in this league uh, where our winemaking culture is historic. It's uh, 13,000 years old. So is Iran, so is Georgia, so is uh, a few other countries in this part of the world. This is where it all started. And Iran is one of the key players, if you will. The only bad part was that in 1944 uh, years ago, 1979, with the revolution, over 200 wineries closed overnight. So drinking is illegal. But there is this whole culture of wine. It is so much wealth uh, there through what I had read. So I thought, you know, I have a winery in Armenia. I cannot make yet wine in Iran. So I have to make it in Armenia. So I, uh, there was a ch challenge for me. I had to do it in a short time. And so I went to Iran, sourced grapes in Kurdistan, and I brought Iranian grapes. So, so now, and then I made the first Iranian wine. 
And what happened afterwards was I realized that making uh, is making Iranian wine or wine from Iranian grapes gave this opportunity to thousands of Iranians who live in the diaspora to be able to drink a bottle of wine, their parents who had the memories, the amount of people who have written to me saying, I want my father's 70th birthday is coming, I would like, how can I find it in London, here, there, because they, they know it is the value of a bottle of wine that can give to to their their culture so that they can remember how beautiful it was, uh, you know, pre-revolution. Um, the country is probably still beautiful. The country is beautiful. It just is a shame that wine isn't part of it. But I think that's temporary. Within five to ten years, there will be wine made in Iran. So hopefully, if anything I did, it helps start a conversation. You um, fail for whatever reason, and you say, no, we can do it. You motivate everyone around you. Someone told after your movie, Va has bigger than life persona, which is the case. But you also cry when you see beautiful art, when you listen to beautiful music. And this um, hopeless romanticism that you have also came to not quitting at anything. Can you share some of the stories or maybe just one story of where not quitting has taken you and what is it that you would want the audience today and millions through the videos to take away and learn and say, uh-huh, okay. yes, I should do it. Well, um, a lot of times when you make a decision and you want to do something, a lot of, many, many people will have their own point of view and say, oh, it can't be done. Uh, oh, it's impossible or it's difficult or, oh, you're going to waste time. It's not going to happen. What not? But the biggest one, and I will share it in publicly, uh, is the narrative. It's a couple of thousand. Yes. Like, there's a big light, so I'm not seeing anybody here. So. Um, the biggest one or uh, is the idea that true love belongs either in novels or in movies. And this is, uh, it's a sad thing. Because a lot of people, and if you continue that narrative of, oh, it can't be, it's impossible, no, it's not true, only in movies, only in Casablanca, only here, there is where things happen, is a wrong thing. And um, um, this is delicate conversation, of course, but um, when I met you, um, I skipped a few heartbeats, and it's like, whoa, and uh, and from that day on, every day, that's <laughs> um, uh, every every day, every week, every month, it just gets more intense. It gets better, and um, and it is a, a wonderful feeling to be able to share life with somebody. And the good moments, the sad moments, the dark moments, everything else, it is, uh, it is, uh, that's the one that people shouldn't quit. You know, if you studied the wrong thing, oh, you can't quit, it's not a big deal, you study something else. You know, I, now I'm still thinking, like, what am I going to do when I grow up, you know? I was thinking astronaut from the speech, but it's like, no, I don't think astronaut being an astronaut is your thing. But uh, it is, um, and if you have... Um, uh, you're kind of young at heart and you're excited and you're learning new things. It's an absolutely wonderful thing to do. Yeah, so. If you were to give just one final sentence, one thing, you have an incredible journey. If you could give a silver lining for all of us, is there anything you could that comes to your mind? Uh, anything that comes to mind would be minimizing it because it's a very complex thing. But I would say probably whatever you do, do it passionately. 
you know, really love what you're doing. Because the minute you love what you're doing, you don't realize you're doing anything. You're always on vacation. You don't need to take a vacation, you know. I mean, in some ways, I'm minimizing it, but passion drives you. Passion in everything that you do and, and beauty in life. You know, sometimes we just, it's there and we don't see it. There's beauty in so many things. And it's not only in a gallery that you look at art. There's beauty in life, so many, so many places. And and we have just to stop and listen. You know, today we, uh, we saw and listening uh, and using your senses is probably the most, something we all have and we don't need to acquire. We already have it and just to use it. You know, and life is beautiful. Just live it up.